So we're picking it up in the place where the people, the children of Israel, just stood up to Saul and said, Sorry, Saul, we're not going to let you kill your son, Jonathan, the war hero that saved our nation, that just stepped up to the plate. We're not going to let you do that because you're trying to save face. So if you wanted to back up, you could check that out maybe later on tonight or whatever. That's in chapter 14 at the end. And so everybody basically after that, Saul didn't try to stop them or refute anything. They just went home. Everybody said, okay, the day's over. See you later. Jonathan's not dying. And so we pick up in chapter 15, verse 1. And Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. And I know we read this last week, but I I wanted to just pause here for a minute and take note. Samuel comes right out, right off the bat, and he gives Saul a reminder, really, of where he came from. Like, you, you, you weren't really anything, right? And God brought me in. We anointed you. So the reminder of who he is. And then he gives him a warning to listen to or heed the word of God. The reminder that it was the Lord who anointed him king over Israel. Sort of implying that it really wasn't a whole lot to do with you, Saul. It was God doing this work. It was God bringing you, kind of like implying that this is God's choosing. Don't build yourself up. Don't set yourself up as this awesome, mighty king. You were out chasing donkeys. And God picked you. And God saw you and God chose you. It's not you. It's the work of the Lord. Now, and I I, I look at this and I I see this morning and I think, I I don't think it was like a mom warning. I don't think it was Samuel saying to Saul, you know, like as God would say, you know, remember, I brought you into this kingdom and I can take you out of it. Your mom ever said that to you? (laughs) I brought you into this world and I can take you right out of it. Now, I don't think that was God's because we don't see God's heart like that towards Saul, but we do see, we do see God's broken heart. We're going to see. But then he warns Saul that he should heed the voice of the words of the Lord, and he's going to tell him the exact words, give him very clear direction momentarily, specific words that God was going to give to him that he was to obey. And I guess the whole reason that I stop and look at this is to see the love and mercy of God towards Saul. When I see him stopping to say, Saul, pay attention. There's a big one coming. Listen to my words. God is going out of his way to give Saul a warning to hear his word. I mean, to me, I just see mercy on Saul's life. It's a, it's a reach of mercy to a king who's becoming to become, or beginning to become full of himself. It's a reach for mercy. Saul, listen to my word. I guess <laughs> for us, you know, God has gone out of his way to give us his word as well. He's gone out of his way. He's gone, I put in my notes, so far out of his way. And not only did he give us the law and the prophets, but then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then the word died to make a way where there was no way. So that our sin would not separate us from God. And it didn't stop there. He also, he gave us all of the gospels. He gave us the epistles. He gave us the revelation of Jesus. And then when, I, when I look at this stuff, when I look at the, the links that God goes to, to kind of stoop down to our level, like maybe we would with our kids to say, look, don't play with that knife, you know. Look, I'm coming, I'm going out of my way to show you and I, and I have to think, for God so loved the world that he gave. Man, he's too good. 
So here's the reminder, here's the warning, and here's the word. This is the specific word to King Saul, verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. How he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. He says, now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now, I don't really want to get into this, but if you're joining us here tonight, you're like, whoa, man, God's mean. Or whoa, man, what? I don't want to mess with God. <sighs> and yeah, it's true you don't want to mess with God. What you want to do is yield to him. And, and really what we're seeing here is that the Amalekites have been given 400 years to yield to God, and they won't. They will not yield to God. And so you kind of get the picture of the rabid dog coming into the playground. If you have a gun, stop the dog because he's going to infect the children. He's going to bite, and he already has the, the poisonous sin within him. He's going to die anyways. This needs to be stopped. And, and I talked about this last week, how God's ways are above our ways, but I don't want to use that as sort of a lame disclaimer. I mean, sometimes we're just guilty of doing that, of saying, well, God's ways are above our ways, so we don't have to explain anything. Well, it, that's true in a sense, but this isn't what God's like. God is fair, God is just, God is righteous, God is good. So what this reminds us of, and myself as well, is that when we start judging God by our own human standards, we get into trouble. Because if we're thinking, God shouldn't do that, I would never do that. You shouldn't do that. Let me just tell you right off the bat, you should not take judgment into your own hands. That's a good thing. But we do not know the reasons that God has. And we cannot put ourselves in the same level as judging those people like God can. I mean, when it really boils down to it, we're all going to stand before God on judgment day. And there's only going to be two judgments, either by our works or by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That that blood's been applied to the doorpost of our hearts, of our lives, and has washed us whiter than the snow. So here we are, we're in a place where we're watching, some, we're watching the wrath of God. And it's one of those crazy things. It's one of those things that I think is hard for us to grasp fully. And I know I mentioned this last week, but I wanted to give you the, the actual chapter and verse. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17, is the, the chapter that God describes what's going on here with these Amalekites. So I'm just going to read it. You can flip there if you want to. Deuteronomy 25, 17. It says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. How he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and you were weary, he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be, and here's the prophecy of today, where we're at in the scripture. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around, that the land which the Lord your God is going to give you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. So God is saying, this is going to happen. He hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't decided something new. He's just coming through on his word. And this it's just something that God does. God comes through on his word. And for us that know him, man, we are thankful that he comes through on his word. He's not like a man. And we're going to see some more into that in a little bit, just in a few, a few verses here. But there's a couple of things that I want to bring up. And the first one is, that last week, we sort of looked at the way that the Amalekites attacked the rear. And we, we kind of see that. It, it, it gives us even more. The stragglers, the tired, the weary in the rear. In, in other words, it was kind of a lame or a low thing to do, right? The second thing, something else I wanted to mention, was the way that they didn't fear God. And I have that kind of highlighted here in my Bible, in the end of verse 18, where it says, he, and he did not fear God. I'm talking about Deuteronomy chapter 25, end of verse 18. 
And one of the things that, I don't know, it's, it's, I can't judge them over the children of Israel. Because the children of Israel, wandering through the wilderness, they were known for their great attitude. I'm being sarcastic. They were known for complaining and murmuring as, they're, as God's walking them through and providing for them. And what was at the front of the pack of the herd leading them on? It was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Like the very presence of God is there. And they're like, oh, this is lame, God. You know? And, and, <laughs> but at the same time, like, this is kind of the same thing that's happening. Amalek, the Amalekites, they're attacking the people of God. The pillar's leading them, and they have no respect, no regard for God. They don't care about that. They're just attacking. Personally, I don't think they were getting rich from attacking the weak tired, weary, stragglers in the back. They were just being vicious. So then the third thing, the last thing was that God had, and we already mentioned this, but God had already said, he had mentioned in Deuteronomy that this was something where he was going to do. He wasn't going to change his mind. And like I said, we're going to see a little bit more into that down a little further in our study tonight. So verse 4. So he just got the directive in verse 4. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telim. 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. And then Saul came, uh, said to the, the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So we have these polar opposites, but they're encamped close, right? One was hurting them as they came out of Egypt. The other tribe, the, the tribe that was um, Moses' in-laws, they were helping them as they came out of, in, out of Egypt. And, and the Kenites there at the end of uh, verse 6, they went ahead and left. They departed. So we see this distinction in God's judgment. God doesn't just go ahead and dump his wrath on these innocent people. And I think I mentioned it last week, but I, I just wanted to mention it again. God's judgment is concise. And here's something with God. When his judgment comes on the scene, there's no collateral damage. There's not like, oops, you were just too close. There isn't. And if you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, that didn't happen. Remember, Abraham kept whittling them down, kept going, but God, if there's only 30, and God's like, okay, if there's 30, God is merciful. He takes no joy in the judgment or the death of the wicked, and the Bible clearly tells us that. He's not getting something out of this. What he does is for a righteous cause. There is no, I love this, there is no collateral damage with God. With man, not the case. And that's something that we saw also in Jericho. If you remember, God spared the family of Rahab, the harlot, whose house was on the wall, the wall that God brought down, except for the section where Rahab's house was. I personally, I absolutely love this because I just shared some of this with the Christian school, showed them the archaeology, that there is, the, the record says that from Rahab's house, they were, the, if you remember, the spies went out the window and escaped into the mountains behind the city. If you look at the actual archaeology, the, the dig site of Jericho, there's only one section of the wall standing, the closest section to the mountains behind the city. It's just, you look at it, you go, Yes! Like, it just lines perfectly with the story. Like, what we have is a history book because what we have is a history book, right? What we have is God's word. God's not lying. So Rahab is just another example of God wanting people to repent. And Rahab's a beautiful example because Rahab isn't like, and God wanted the good religious people to repent. She's a harlot, but she knew what she was doing was wrong. She wanted God. She chose him. He saved her, and she walked with him. It's a beautiful story, an amazing story. And so when I look at God judging people, and I look at God judging Agag like he's going to, and the Amalekites, I know his heart. It's good. It's good. Verse 7. 
And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. First red flag. And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, and the lambs. And all that was good. And here is the kicker. And were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. What I'm seeing here is a picture of sinful man. I think we all can, can relate to this in, in some way. He keeps the king alive. Now, we're not sure why he keeps the king alive. Maybe it was for one of those, hey, I'm going to spare you. When you rebuild your kingdom, remember you owe me one. I don't know exactly his thinking for sparing the king alive. And then he killed all the people, but kept alive the best of the livestock, unwilling to destroy the best of the livestock. And, and to me, when I look at this, I look at Saul, I think this is all that flesh. This is all that sin nature, that fallen nature that we're, we're all kind of subject to, we're all kind of susceptible to. And I thought, I thought of something as I'm going through here. I think I, I could sort of understand the text if it read, he killed all the livestock, but was unwilling to kill the women, the children, and the infants. Like, I could understand that. But he killed all those people and kept the spoils for himself. He wasn't trying to have mercy. He wasn't trying to do something just. He's trying to get rich. I mean, he's trying to take the fat of the land, the fatlings. That's one of those words that I look at and go, ooh, that sounds tasty. I don't know what it is, but that sounds good. And I think Saul kind of got the same picture. So here is the picture of Saul giving into the flesh. Remember, the Amalekites are a picture of the flesh. Remember, Agag is the king of the Amalekites. What a name. Agag is the king of the Amalekites, and he is the king of the flesh. So here's a little tidbit, a nugget we get out of here. The flesh always wants us to do this sort of thing, to put away the most vile things, kill those things off, the things that maybe people would see outwardly, but keep a little back, keep a little compromise where no one knows. Keep some of the good for ourselves. The only problem is whenever we think we're doing something or getting away with something and no one knows, God sees, God knows, he understands. He's above our ways and he, <laughs> he sees all. And we know another truth from the Bible our sin will find us out. Personally, I'm really glad that our sin finds us out. because It helps us to know we're his kids. And we're not going to get away with it. Ah, <sighs> Thank you, Lord. One commentary said this. If, it said, our flesh doesn't need to be rehabbed. Our flesh needs to be killed. One of the pictures we get from Agag here. We need to die daily. We need to take up our cross and follow him. Myself, my flesh needs to die. And the evidence or some of the backing of scripture, Romans 8, 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Man, Lord, we need your spirit. Amen. Verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set, set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Now, I want to just pull a couple of things out of here. Here's one of the parts that I didn't mention last week. I just read through, but I really wanted to touch on, and it's in verse 11. And it's called a big word that's hard for me to say, but I'm going to try it anyways. It's an anthrop anthropomorphism. You guys heard of an anthropomorphism? Which means an interpretation of what is not human or personal in terms of human or personal characteristics. You know, a lot of people use these kind of things with their pets. 
You know, they they look at their pet and they're, oh, Fluffy, he's so sad, you know. And it's like, well, I don't really know if he's sad or not. He wants his bone. I don't understand all of those things. But we do that. We'll do that with different things. And here, in here, in the Word of God, it's somebody that's a human trying to describe kind of human-like attributes to God. Trying to, trying to say this is what God's feeling. But the bottom line is, in this section, God didn't change his mind about Saul. God had to follow through with his covenant that he had already given the children of Israel. So if you skip down to verse 29, we get another little insight into this. It says, And also the strength of Israel will not lie or relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. The, one, one interesting thing that's an awesome thing is this is like the only time we see this name of God in the Bible, the strength of Israel. I love that. It's the name of God. The strength of Fill your name in the blank. The strength of Isaac is God. Oh, Lord, let it be in our lives. Amen? But the strength of Israel. So God is saying, God will not lie or relent. He is not a man that he should relent or repent, which means to change your mind. God doesn't change his mind. He's not lying. He hasn't changed his mind. And really what he's talking about is his covenant with Israel, that if they will walk according to his word, he will bless them. He'll hold back the enemies all around. He'll give them rain. He'll give them prosperous, you know, food, agriculture. But if they do not heed his word according to what we've seen in the law, and if they turn from God and begin to worship idols and put themselves on a throne or whatever it is, it said that he would put the curses of the other nations upon them. And we, we've been over this quite a few times, but God is saying, if you turn and do those ungodly things in your life, I'm not going to keep blessing that. I'm going to put the same curses that I'm putting on those nations for the reason, at the same reason that the curses are on those nations. So we see this, and then we see this reason that God is sharing that he's, Saul has turned back from following him and has not performed his commandments. And then we see, to me, a snapshot of God's heart revealed in Samuel. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord, all night. When we turn from following God, turn from the good counsel of his word, and walk in our own wisdom, it's breaking God's heart. I mean, this is the picture. You know, for us, we're in a little bit of a different situation where we don't, we don't receive the judgment of God. Listen, the judgment of God for your sins fell squarely on Jesus at the cross. And I'm so thankful for that. But I still know that when I make mistakes, I get a spanking called the repercussions of my own sinful decision. And those things come with me and they can stay with me for a long time. But again, I'm thankful for God and his chastising the sons that he loves, the kids that he loves. So let's keep going on. Verse 12. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he has set up a monument for himself and has gone on around and passed by and got down, gone down to Gilgal. And then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Christianese, praise God, brother. I just did something to disobey God, but hey, man, God's so good. Praise God. People do that. We do that. We can be guilty of that. But here is the beginning of us seeing and being revealed to us Saul's self-deceivedness, if you want to call it that. That he was self-deceived. And it's kind of obvious that he's full of himself. The first thing he does after this <laughs> victory and disobedience of the Lord is go build himself a monument. Not that the Lord's done anything, but look at how great I am. For the victory that he brought to Israel. And of course, God is the one that said, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to bring you the victory. He's the one who gave the victory, but the king's taking credit. And he kind of comes out, like I said, to meet Samuel and is like, I have performed the command of the Lord. 
And Samuel's answer is amazing. He says, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Modern interpretation. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Saul. The, the livestock's too loud. Say it again. You obeyed the Lord. Right? Like, I'm hearing the evidence of the lie that you're telling me. And here he is. He's, he's deceived in his own heart. He, he's, he's rationalizing his own sin. Saying, I'm all good with God, man. It's cool. I just partially obeyed. And here's where we get some of this insight. To partially obey God is to disobey God. To have buffet Christianity to say, God, in this part of my life, I want to honor you. In this part of my life, I don't want to hear what you have to say to my life is to push God out. And we can fool ourselves. And here's a picture of that clearly in the scripture for us to learn from. I don't want that in my life. I just want to be real, man. Saul is going to have a few more opportunities to say, I blew it. And he's not going to say it. May we be real, you know? May we be real enough to admit our fault and our mistake. Verse 15, and Saul said, They, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. He's not my God, it's your God. He's kind of being honest in that sense, in that word. And the rest, all the crummy stuff, we got rid of. And I think to myself, the boldness of Saul. You know what comes to my mind here, scripturally in the New Testament, is, is if you guys remember in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, to just come before him and just to really just lie. And lie before the Lord. And, and say, oh, we took and we kept the best to give as a gift to God. That's what Saul's saying. Ananias and Sapphira said, we've given everything to the Lord. They were holding back. And, and here is this picture. And when we do this, we're hurting ourselves. Not hurting God. He's going to be okay. Hurt, hurting the other people some, yes, but we're hurting ourselves. One commentary said this, and I thought it was a great point. We are not to bring to the altar of worship, or the altar of getting right with God through the blood of the Lamb, the thing that the Lord said put it to death on the battlefield. And kind of the picture that I get, one of, the, one of those ideas is just that we would allow a sin, a pet sin or whatever you want to call it, in our lives, just kind of presuming that God will keep being gracious and forgive it when it's something that he's called us to be in battle with and to kill in our lives. I was talking to a brother just today about pornography, that this is something that sometimes people think, well, it's just my little thing, it's my hidden thing, but it will destroy your life, and God is calling us to kill that thing and to, have bat to make war. We should be coming in here with a limp. And what's the matter with you? I am in battle, and it's life or death, and I want with everything I have to honor God. I don't want to mention this to condemn anyone, but to call warriors to battle. To see sin for what it is. Not some innocent, guilty pleasure, whatever. That we can turn to on occasion for gratification, but that it's life and death. And if you've ever had the thought that said, well, it's not really life or death. Just look at the cross. One of my favorite lyrics to an old punk Christian song, when it came to do or die, he died for me. Verse 16. Oh, Saul. Then Samuel said to Saul, shut it. I mean, that's the modern translation. I don't know what kind of version you have. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Saul said to him, speak on. 
So verse 17, Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? When you were humble, right? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Verse 18, now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. Fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Samuel's just calling it out. This is what you're really doing, Saul. And so, verse 20, Saul said to him, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Self-deception. I've gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder. There it is again, the people blaming other people. I'm supposed to be the leader, but the people did it. They took the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, the best of the things which, could have, which should have been utterly destroyed. Now he's kind of admitting, yeah, I guess you're, they should have been. But they brought them for this reason, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Saul, man, continues with these excuses. Excuse after excuse and rationalizing his sin. We're, we're prone to be like Saul. I mean, I hope that we can see that. We're prone to rationalize our sin, be easy on our own sinfulness, and write it off as, well, that's kind of reasonable. It's okay to take some fatlings home. They look good. But that's not the truth. Our flesh, Amalek, must die as we follow Jesus. And so I have to spoil the story right now because Saul, because Saul didn't obey this word, Saul is going to die at the hands of an Amalekite. He's going to die at the hands of an Amalekite. Fighting in this last battle, and guess who he's fighting against? Amalekites. Could you imagine? I mean, there's more to this story. We're seeing there's more disobedience than just what's on the surface. And so he's fighting the Amalekites. If you guys remember the story, he was, knew he was going to be beat, and he fell on his sword. And then he didn't die. And so this young man, this Amalekite was walking by, and he called him over to finish him off. And the Amalekite killed him and went and told David, and David said, I can't believe you raised your hand against the king and killed the Amalekite boy. It's a whole mess of a story. We're going to see pretty soon. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 1. But another thing that happened because of Saul's disobedience on this day, at this time, is in the story of Esther. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the story of, of Esther, but there was a villain in that book, like a Hitler-type guy named Haman, who was trying to wipe out the whole nation of Israel. And if you go into Esther and you look when it lists where Haman came from, he was an, they call him an Agite, an Agagite. It's Agag's descendant. He was an Agagite, somebody that should have been wiped out. Yeah, it sounds funny, Agagite. There's too many eggs in there and gites. Uh, but to just see like his compromise that God wanted to stop coming back to take him out. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a thing. We have a condition as humans where it's a thing where the sin that we think we want and embrace will kill us. It will take us out. It's a thing, and it's the flesh. And so Samuel says these words in verse 22 and addresses like the heart of the whole thing. He says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You're, you're going to disobey him to come worship? You think that makes him happy? And that's what God's plan is for your life. It's better to obey than sacrifice. And that's what he says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed, to listen to his word better than the fat of rams, better than the best part of the offering to God. Samuel reveals a truth in the heart of the matter that obedience is a more pure, genuine form of worship than an offering. Obedience is a more pure form of worship. It's a good thing to God. 
You can walk by that box in the back and throw some dollars in it and it not be a whole lot. But when it comes down to how we live in our home with our spouse, with understanding, to obey him is better than sacrifice. It's better than the fat of our offering. To give something that doesn't matter as much as him and his, you know, to show love to God is obedience. It's through the word. It's in the word. And this isn't the only place we hear that. In Hebrews chapter 10, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offering and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. The contrast, sacrifice and offerings you have no pleasure but to do your will, O God. Psalm 51. 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it, nor do you delight in burnt offering. Listen to this, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Proverbs 21.3, to do righteous and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Jeremiah 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and your burnt offering to your sacrifices and eat, and eat oh, I'm sorry, add your burnt offering to your sacrifices and eat meat, for I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices, but this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. It's not something new, but it means more to God to obey. Verse 23, he says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Excellent verse for teenagers. <laughs> for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the lord he also has rejected saul you saul from being king so we see this how god views god's heart toward rebellion and resisting his rule as the sin of witchcraft as the sin of iniquity and idolatry and it's a matter of kingdoms. You, <clears throat> you, when we rebel against God, we're saying, you're not the king of my life. I'm the king of my life, or whatever else thing we're turning to. Rebellion is resisting. It's resisting God's rule. It's resisting his authority in our lives. And he's saying, it's like turning to idols, turning to darkness, witchcraft. <laughs> I guess I have to share the story with you. So my brother, my little brother Sam was at Bible college and uh, they have like these dorm stewards that would come and they would inspect the rooms for cleanliness, right? And so my brother's duty like this, I don't know if it was a month or whatever, it was to clean the bathroom. So he, the, the dorm guy walks into the shower and looks in the shower and goes, oh my goodness, I can't believe, look at all this hair. You haven't even cleaned anything. And my brother was like, what? And he walks in there and they, sure enough, there's like all this hair like on the ground and come to find out. And the dorm steward said, Samuel, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Like just totally use that line on him, right? Come to find out, the dorm steward went in, and as he was leaning in to look at the shower, like ripped a little patch of chest hair out and threw it in the bottom of the shower. So funny. But anyways, I just have to share with you this story. It's funny now, but I think at the time, my brother was floored. He was like, I did not. You, you're serious. Anyway. Oh. May God be the king of our heart. And may it be shown, not in our extravagant giving, but in our obedience to him. And in our being real with him and with the body of Christ. Amen. Verse 24, so Saul said to Samuel, finally, first time ever, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words. 
because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Little excuse. Verse 25, Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. So here he wants them to come with him. Pardon what I've done. No genuine sign of repentance. No, bring all those livestock up here. I want to get right with God. Let's, let's, let's slaughter them all. Let's be right with God. Bring Agag up. I want to be right with God. There's not a repentance. There's, I'm sorry, will you come with me for my photo opportunity to worship before the people so that I have your approval. And it's a sad thing, but that's what's really happening. And then verse 26, but Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king of Israel. Whew. Good stuff. When we reject the Lord, the word of the Lord, we're rejecting him as being our king. We are. It's a truth. One more time, God views partial obedience as disobedience. Verse 27. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore it. And so... Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent for he is not a man that he should relent. Verse 30, and then he said, Saul, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before the people Israel. And return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and worshiped the Lord. Now, I, I, as soon as I read that, I thought, Samuel, what are you doing? He just said, it's so the elders can see me, so the people can see me, so they can ha know that I'm, I'm kind of in cahoots with you. But Samuel's going to go back and he's going to show him something. He's going to go back, not really to honor Saul, but to show in my opinion, Saul and the kingdom, what repentance would look like. So verse 32, Samuel goes back. Samuel says, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. And so Agag came to him cautiously. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. Right? We got some smooth words from Agag walking up to the situation going, you know, I'm so glad that all of this is water under the bridge. Let bygones be bygones here. Again, isn't that our flesh that just wants to say, well, just let, let, me, let me hang, man. It's cool. I'm cool with you. Our sin nature. Let me hang out. But verse 33, Samuel said, As your sword, Agag, has made women child, childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgag, Gilgal. Very elegantly written verse. <laughs> verse 34. And Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So God's following through on his word. As Saul turns away from him, God's going to remove him from that place uh, of being a king. But we see a couple of things. Samuel dealt with that picture of the flesh and showed us that it's not a game. And then... Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death, which paints for us one last picture as we close tonight. Sin and compromise so often take the best influences out of our lives. Giving in to those things, rationalizing sin. And Samuel finally said, okay, you can have what you want. You know, and I think to myself, God, will you send us more Samuels into our lives that stand for the truth? And when we hear the truth, God, may we not rationalize. May we not pull back. May we say, that's me. May we do what David did, the difference. David said, I am the man. I'm found sinful. 
And he repented before God. It's the difference between Saul and David. A man after God's heart and a man after his own flesh. May we heed the word of God. May we want to obey him. May we confess our sins and our shortcomings. Amen. Let's all stand together. God, what a crazy story. What a crazy bit of history, Lord, and I, I pray that you'd help us to learn our lessons from it, God. I pray that you'd help us to walk after your word, Lord, and I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that it confronts us, Lord, and, and if there's any of us here tonight that are going, that's hitting me square, praise God, and help us to not be hearers only, but doers of your word. Make those things right. So, Lord, we thank you tonight. We praise you. God, help us to go home and get some rest and get up in the morning and spend some time with you. We praise you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys.